exposure to it. I want to take this opportunity, inshallah, to dig deeper into the issue based upon, based upon what we find coming to us from the Kitab of Allah and the Sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam to Salim and Kathira. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one of the greatest and most trend, tremendous athars that come to us from all of the companions. He said to his students who were from the Tabi'een, كيف أنتم إذا لبستكم فتنة يحرم فيها الكبير ويربو فيها الصغير ويتخذوها الناس سنة إذا غدر منها شيء قيل غدر السنة How is it going to be? He said to his students and he's from the companions. He said, how is it going to be when the time comes to you people when the fitna is going to be so severe you'll be engulfed by the fitna. It will surround you on every angle, every street. And the older person will become senile during that time, meaning he's obsolete. People are not going to listen to him. The ulama and the people who know, the people of experience, he'll become senile. Or the fitna is so great that it will freak him out. And the young person will crawl. The young person will crawl means that the young person is the one who people are going to listen to and they're going to take their religion from them. People are going to be without any hayat, without any wara, no awareness, no taqwa. They put themselves forward as being the pinnacles and the people who speak on behalf of the deen. He said it's going to be so bad, the fitna, that if something is changed from the religion during that time, what the people know is the religion, the people are going to say the sunnah has been changed. The people who heard that, they say, Ya Aba Abdurrahman, Ya Abdullah bin Mas'ud. When is that? Tell us, when is that time? He said, إِذَا كَثُرَ قُرَّاءُكُمْ وَقَلَّ فُقَهَاءُكُمْ وَكَثُرَ أُمَرَاءُكُمْ وَقَلَّ الْأُمَنَاءُكُمْ وَالْتُمِسُ الدُّنْيَا بِعَمِنَ الْآخِرَةِ He said, the time is going to be when there are many people who read, many people memorize the Qur'an, Many people are going to be talking, giving dawah. Every Amr, Bakr, and Zaid, he's going to give dawah. He's going to be in city center. He's going to be on the internet. He's going to be all over the place. Just unqualified, incompetent people. Everyone who has something to say, he's, got, he's going to say. He's, he doesn't find the venue. If the readers of the Quran and the teachers, if they become many and the fuqaha become few. Many people will be talking, but not many people have fiqh and comprehension. Not people will know what they're talking about. They want to talk about takfir, they want to talk about jihad, they want to talk about big issues. There are going to be many people going to be reading, they have something to say, but there are only going to be a few fuqaha, people who understand what they're reading. And if the leaders, the umara, if they become a lot, and the umana, the trustworthy, become few people. The Salafi person is trustworthy. He's an individual who talks based upon what he knows. He's an individual who doesn't put himself in an arena that he's not qualified, he's not competent, he doesn't know. But we have a situation right now where the Salafi person who's claiming Salafia, the Asif Shadid, and the Salafi is supposed to be the one who's better than everybody else in practicing the religion. He's the one who changes things and he lies just to keep himself up high, his group up high. He says, so if the people like the umana, the trustworthy ones, they become few, and the umara, the leaders, everybody wants to be a leader. If they become a lot, and the people start seeking the hereafter by actions of the dunya, if he is inquired or requested to give a lesson, a doubt, he won't come unless you pay him money. You have to give him something of the dunya or he's not going to do it. He wants to be in the limelight or something like that. That hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, it gives us the tashkhis of what we're dealing with right now, our time, right now. In the Arab world, like in some parts of West Africa, they're on the Maliki Madhat. Al-Imam Malik was from the Salaf. Al-Imam Malik, his minhaj was the minhaj of the Salaf. So if a person is Maliki, he has to realize that Al-Imam Malik said, 
the last of this ummah won't benefit with anything except what the first of this ummah benefit with or by it. The person is Maliki and his aqeed is other than Imam Maliki. And Imam Abu Hanifa told the people, take the athar, take the narrations, take from where I took from. The person is Hanafi and he's on something other than that. So the point here is, khwani, that we're living and we're dealing with the time of a lot of problems. If a person takes the minhaj of the people of the past and he comprehends it, and the more understanding he gets about it, inshallah, the more thabit he becomes during this time of fitin, trials, and tribulations. So we're going to begin, inshallah, ta'ala, by first explaining to you about this word that we hear a lot. That if you were to ask the person who's using the word, where do you get that word from? Where does that word come from? And do you comprehend the implications of the word and the depth and the seriousness of that word? I mean, hajj. Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in two ayahs of the Quran that we bring to your attention. First ayat is in Surah al jathiyah Surah al jathiyah He said, ثُمَّ جَعَنَّاكَ عَلَى شَرِيَّةً مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this surah, and then we made you, Ya Muhammad, upon a sharia, a jurisprudence, a legislation, sharia. We gave you a sharia. So follow that sharia that we gave you. And don't follow the desires of those who don't know. So now the emphasis here is on the word sharia. Surah al-Jathiyah. This religion has a legislation. A way of doing things. That's the first ayat. The second ayat of the Quran is Surah Al Ma'ida. Allah Ta'ala used this word of Sharia and another word, Minhaj. He said in Surah Al Ma'ida, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Likullin ja'alna minkum shir'atan wa minhaja. We gave all of you, all of the previous nations, we gave you a Sharia. And we gave you a minhaj. So the word minhaj is in the Quran in Surat and Ma'ida. The one who's using this word, the minhaj of the salaf, minhaj is salaf. Where is it in the Quran? It's in Surat and Ma'ida. So it's not a new word that people came up with. So the issue that I want to bring to your attention concerning these two ayat, ayat in al Jathiyah, Allah told the Prophet, وسلم, we gave you a sharia. Follow that Sharia, Ya Muhammad. Follow it. And don't follow the people who don't know. Kufav Quraysh, the Yahud, Nasara, Sikhs. Don't follow people who are Muslims and they don't know the Sharia. Follow the Sharia. The other ayat in Surah Al-Ma'idah mentioned, we made everyone who came before, all of the nations, they had a Sharia and they had a Minhaj. So that goes to show that there's a difference between Sharia and a Minhaj. That's the first point. Ahi Sharif, Abdul Qadir. There is a difference between Sharia and Minhaj. What's the difference? Those scholars of the past who didn't leave anything unturned for us, they explained to us, alhamdulillah, starting with the companions, Radwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. The great scholar of Islam who was from Yemen, Al Imam Abdul Razak al Sanani, he has a book of tafsir. He was from the teachers of Al Imam Ahmed. He has one of the two Musannafin. He wrote a book, Kitab al Musannaf, tremendous scholar in Islam. Showing his minhaj and his seriousness in Al Islam, he didn't write a book about hadith like Bukhari, a Muslim. He wrote a hadith where he just concerned himself with what did the companions do? What did the tabi'een do? Because he understood if you want to be a Muslim in 2015, you have to know what those companions did. So Al Imam Abdul Razak al Sanani has a tafsir, as well as the greatest tafsir on the face of the earth, Al Imam Muhammad ibn Jarir al Tabari. They brought the chain of narration with Abdullah ibn Abbas about this ayat. We made for everybody a sharia, a shar'an. And a minhaj. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, We made them a sabil and we gave them a sunnah. We show them a sabil, a way. 
Musa, Ishaq, Yaqub, all of them. They had a way and they had a sunnah, something that their prophet brought, the religion that their prophet brought. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, in his Sahih al-Bukhari, he brought in two chapters of his book this explanation of Abdullah ibn Abbas. In the book of Al-Iman, he brought it. And in the book of At-Tafsir, he said that Abdullah ibn Abbas said, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَ Abdullah ibn Abbas said the meaning of that ayah. This companion who was taught by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said the meaning, we gave them a sharia and a minhaj. He said we gave them a sabil and we gave them a sunnah. The sunnah and the way of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I know, Ikhwani, I mentioned some issues concerning names, but those names of those books and all those ulama is for the more serious student. And we have to mention these things because we do have students who are more serious than other people. I don't mention those names and those books to mesmerize you. It's so that the student who's more serious can go back because this is a class that really I want you people to be writing. The one who's sitting and he's just between Maghrib and Isha, alhamdulillah. But we want our students to really be on this issue with tenacity and understanding and comprehending what time it is and what's going on so that we'll be able to navigate with all of this drama that's going on. So the great scholar Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani who explained the ahadith of Sahih bukhari in his book, Fath al-Bari, he had another book in which he serviced Sahih al-Bukhari. I gave a talk the other day on Saturday about al Imam al Bukhari, and I told you people that Sahih al Bukhari, there's no book that was serviced more than the Sahih of al Imam al Bukhari after the Quran. The scholars came and they gave 53, 53 explanations of the book. In addition to the explanations of the book, they talked about every narrator in the book. The scholars came and they said, these are the men that Bukhari has in his book that are found in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed or the Musnad of Al Imam Al Tayyalisi and so forth and so on. The book has been taken care of. One of the people who took care of the book is Ibn Hajar. And then Ibn Hajar explained the book in Fatul Bari. No explanation is better than that, with the exception of Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, who also called his book Fatul Bari, but he died before he finished it. So Ibn Hajar, he completed it. But Ibn Hajar, he had some issues where he made some mistakes in Aqidah. Nonetheless, he was from the ulama of al-Hadith. Ibn Hajar wrote a book that is called Taghliq al-Ta'liq. There are certain ahadith in Sayyid al-Bukhari where they appear that the chain of narration is not connected. And Imam Ibn Hajar came and he showed they were all connected in service in the book. So in that particular book, this narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, it appears... Abdullah ibn Abbas, it appears that it's not connected. Al-Imam ibn Hajr secured and he established for us, it is connected. So Bukhari mentioned it in two places. Concerning this issue of Al-Minhaj, that's where it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah. What is the min- meaning of that word Minhaj? Most of us are not Arabs. If you would ask the Arab who's sitting here, what is Minhaj? He may say it's the way, and it is that. But it has more meaning to that. So if someone were to ask you in the Arabic language, what is the minhaj or minhaj? The minhaj or the minhaj is at-tariq al-wadih, al-bayyin, al-sahl. It is the path that is clear. It is the path that is comprehensive and it is explained. It is the path that is easy to tread upon. That's the meaning of minhaj in the Arabic language. And that's why one of the greatest scholars of Islam who took care of the Quran, Imam Abu Jafar al-Nuhas, tremendous scholar in many different sciences, he has a book called Ma'ani al-Quran. He doesn't give the tafsir of the Quran, but he explains some ayat and some words and some phrases of the Quran. He said the word as-sirat, ihdina, sirat al-mustaqim. What is the sarat that comes many times in the Quran? What is the meaning of a sarat in the Quran? Al Imam Abu Jafar al Nuhas, he said, a sarat is al minhaj al wadih. When we ask Allah, ihdina sarat al mustaqim, we're asking Allah Azza wa Jal 
guide us to the minhaj, the way that is clear, that is apparent, is comprehensive, and is easy. So one of the interpretations of the Sirat al-Mustaqim, one of the meanings of it is al-minhaj. Again, I repeat, if you are asked, Abdullah, what is the meaning of minhaj in the Arabic language? It is at-tariq al-wadih, the one way, the path that is clear. I want to get from here to Alam Rock. How do I get there? People can send me many different ways. If the person sends you to the way that is clear, direct, comprehensive, that's the minhaj. It is the way that is explained, is comprehensive. That's what Allah gave every nation before, and this is what we have to tread upon. So when we talk about the minhaj, that's the meaning of it in the Arabic language. The way that is clear, is apparent, and it is easy. Remember that. It is easy. As for the sunnah, is this word mentioned in the sunnah? And if so, what does it mean? The word minhaj is mentioned in the sunnah. So for the people who get upset when Salafi people use phrases like as salafiya al hadith al furqat al najiyah and these types of ibarat, these types of phrases, some people get upset because they have a problem. They are on a different minhaj. So they have a problem with this other one. It's not something that's new. This word minhaj is in the Quran and it has its meaning and its explanation by the great scholar of Islam. And it's also in the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the sunnah it shows the authenticity and the seriousness of why a person has to path, he has to tread upon the way of alul hadith and a minhaj. And what was collected by Imam Abu Dawood al-Tayalasi, he has a book called the Musnad. Al-Imam Ahmed, he has a book that is the Musnad, a book of hadith. Again, for the student of knowledge, Al-Imam al-Bukhari, Muslim Abu Dawood, Al-Tirmidhi, and Nasai, Ibn Majah, these people, they brought the hadith, and the way they collected their books of hadith is the book of Iman, and then the book of At-Tahara, and then the book of As-Salat, and then and they brought a hadith to show those issues, how the revelation began. The Musnad does not like that. And many scholars wrote books of hadith that they called the Musnad. So if someone asked you, what is the book of hadith that is the Musnad? The Musnad book is a book in which the scholar only concerned himself with gathering all of the hadith of Abu Huraira, irregardless of what the subject matter is. There's no cohesion. Not like Al Imam al Bukhari. He's going to bring the first chapter in his book, How Revelation Started. So he's going to bring everything about that. And there will be different narrators in those ahadith. The Musnad is not like that. And there are many Masanid, many. One of the most important one, if not the single most important, Al Imam Ahmed, the Imam of Ahl Sunnah. He narrated the hadith that we're about to mention to you right now, in which the word Al Minhaj is mentioned. And Imam Abu Dawood at Tayalasi, as well as Al Imam Ahmed, they brought this hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which the companion, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him. There is some important issues concerned with this hadith. I really don't want to go into it, connected to two other companions. Al Nu'man ibn Bashir, who was very young when he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Nu'man ibn Bashir, him and his father were companions. And he was one of those companions who the Prophet died and he was very young, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet, he narrated a hadith. So although he was very young, the scholars took his hadith, showing that even if a person is very young, as long as he knows what he's doing, his hadith are considered and accepted. And Nurman ibn Bashir, as well as another companion, Abu Thalaba al-Khushani, may Allah be pleased with both of them, they're connected to this hadith I'm about to tell you about Inshallah, the hadith of Hudayf ibn Yaman. I'm not going to go through that. I want the serious student from amongst you to go back and look for the hadith and see what I'm referring to. But anyway, the word minhaj, where is it mentioned? In the sunnah. It's mentioned in the authentic hadith of Hudayf ibn Yaman. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. That was collected by Imam Ahmed, Imam Abu Dawood at Tayalasi. The Prophet told his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, takun an-nabuwatu fikum ma sha'Allah an takun 
ثم إذا شاء الله أن يرفعها يرفعها ثم تكون خلافة على منهاج النبوة إلى إن شاء الله وإذا شاء الله أن يرفعها يرفعها ثم تكون ملكا عادا إلى أن يشاء الله فإذا شاء الله أن يرفعها يرفعها ثم تكون ملكا جبريا ملكا جبريا إلى أن يشاء الله ثم إذا شاء الله يرفعها ثم تكون على خلافة على منهاج الخلافة ثم سكت Now you have to pay attention to this hadith إخواني because the hadith is really important and it's showing the point that we're trying to make. Minhaj is mentioned in the Quran and it's mentioned in the authentic Sunnah. So when Salafi people, the ulama and the people of Salafiyyah say, what's your minhaj? You have to be on the minhaj of the Salaf. These words don't just come out of the sky. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he described five conditions. He said to his companions, Prophecy is going to be with you people for as long as Allah wants it to be with you. And then when Allah wants to take away the prophecy and nubuwa, he's going to take it away. And then after that, the khilafa will be with you. And that khilafa will be on the minhaj of a nubuwa. And it will remain with you as long as Allah wants it to remain with you. And then he'll take it away. And after that khilafah that's on the minhaj of a nubuwa, there's going to be kingdom, kingship. And he described the kingship as ald and the kingship of biting. People are going to be fighting to try to become the rulers in al-Islam. That kingship where everyone is fighting to get it, it will remain with you for as long as Allah wants it to remain with you. And then he'll take it away if he wants to take it away. And then after that comes the fourth situation. And it will be a kingship in which there will be tyranny. People will kill, and people will fight, and people will be oppressive. And that will remain for the time that Allah wants to remain, and then he'll take it away. After those two kingships of oppression, there's going to come the khilafah of a nabuwa. The khilafah on the minhaj of a nabuwa. So those are five states. The first state, there's going to be nabuwa. That's the time he was living with the companions Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nabuwa. And then after he dies, there's going to come the Khilafah on the Minhaj of a Nabuwa. The Khilafah will be on the Minhaj that the Nabi was upon, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the first Minhaj. Khilafah on the Minhaj. After that, Abu Bakr, Ma Uthman, and Ali, after that happens, then it's going to be kingship. The king gives to his son, who gives to his son, who gives to his cousin. And their families are going to rule. And it's going to be biting. People are going to be fighting for it. They're going to want it. And then after that goes, it's going to be kingship of oppression and tyranny. And then after that fourth one comes back, the khilafah of the nabuwa, the minhaj of a nabuwa. Now listen, that's a hadith in which the word minhaj was mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the narrators of the hadith, his name is Habib, he narrated this hadith and he said, I sent this hadith in the written form to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he died in the year 101 and he was considered to be the fifth rightly guided Khalifa. After Abu Bakr Marathman Ali, Abdul Aziz was considered to be the fifth by many scholars. Although Muawiyah is better than him, Although Abdullah bin Zubair is better than him, although Hassan is better than him, but he's considered to be one of the five, the fifth Khalifa al Rashid. Why? Because although he only ruled for three years, his rule was like his relative, Umar ibn al Khattab. Some of the scholars said about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was a scholar and he was a Khalifa. There's a hadith that the Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْعَثُ لِهَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ عَلَى كُلِّ مِئَةَ السَّنَةِ مَنْ يُجَدِّدُ لَهَا أَمْرَ الدِّينِهَا Every 100 years, Al-Mustafa says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every 100 years, Allah will send out and send forth for this ummah 
someone who will renew this ummah, renew the affairs of this ummah, 100 years, every year, every year, someone's going to come out, every year. He's going to be a mujaddid. Not a mujaddid, maz'oom. Many times people in the Muslim world says that this person is a mujaddid, he's a mujaddid, he's a mujaddid, and he has no minhaj. Or his way of existing went against the minhaj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's many examples. But we'll deal with that down the line, inshallah, in these durus. Anyway, ikhwani, one of the narrators in this hadith, he sent the hadith to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to remind him of this hadith, to bring it to his attention. And he said to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, I hope, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Prophet was talking about you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the fifth condition. And then there's going to be a khilafah on the minhaj of a nubuwa. When that letter came to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was happy. He hoped good for it. Now this hadith, ikhwani, as I mentioned, what are we mentioning in this hadith so that I can bring some of your minds back to the square? The hadith goes to show that the word minhaj, it was used by the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, taslim in kathira. Now the question that we want to bring to your attention is, what is the meaning of this hadith? On the minhaj of a nabuwa. It's very clear. And most of you, if not all of you, already know the meaning of the hadith. The meaning of hadith is explained, the tafsir of it, minhaj al nubuwa the khilafah on the minhaj of nubuwa It comes to us from the hadith, again, that was collected by Imam Ahmed and the Ashab al-Sunan, al-Imam Abu Dawood, al-Tirmidhi, al-Nasai, and Ibn Majah, with different chains of narrations and different different words here and there. What is khilafa on the minhaj of a nabuwa? What does it mean? In that hadith that al-Imam Ahmed brought and the Ashab al-Sunan rahimahumullah, the hadith of al-Irbad ibn Sariya. Hey, student of knowledge, you have to memorize this hadith. You have to memorize this narrator. This is a hadith that has to stay in your pocket. You know how Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Jabir ibn Abdullah, they said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to teach us khutbatul haja, the way he used to teach us a surah from the Quran, in alhamdulillahi na'maduhu. You have to learn that. That's something that we should engage our kids in. It's one of those hadith that should stay with you. Al-Irbad ibn Sariya, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fawa'adhana mu'idhatan baligatan. We were sitting with him and he gave us an exhortation and a speech. Dharafat minha al-uyun wa wajilat minha al-qulub. Our eyes shed tears when we heard what he had to say. And our hearts became afraid. We were trembling at the way he was talking. The way he was talking, they say, Ya Rasulullah, ka'annaha mu'idhatu muwadda'an famadha ta'muruna bih. Ya Rasulullah, you're talking to us as if you're giving us a farewell speech. You sound like you're about to leave us the way you're talking. So if that is the case, what do you advise us to do? What do you, what, what, what? Look at the companions and their condition. Not like the people today. All of us, myself included, at the top of the list. Those companions, radiallahu anhum, ikhwani, will deal with this down the line, inshallah. When it came to this issue of loving the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than everybody else. It's serious. It's not no rhetoric. We talked a number of times of the companion Jabir ibn Abdullah. Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram al-Ansari. He was the one who his father was killed in one of the battles. The battle of Uhud or the battle of Badr. And when he was killed, his father son, Jabir, who was one of the six companions, he was young, he narrated the majority of the hadith. The prophet saw him crying, he said, what are you crying for? He said, my father died. Can't believe it. And they were close. The prophet said, don't cry. You know what Allah told me about your father? Allah told me about your father that he spoke to your father without any hijab and he's the only human being that Allah spoke to without any hijab. Everybody else, every Nabi, every Rasul, there was a hijab between him and Allah. And there is an ayat of the Quran that mentions that. 
But Allah spoke to your father directly. And he said to your father, wish for whatever you want. His father, Abdullah ibn Haram and Ansari, radiallahu anhu said, Oh Allah, send me back to the earth so that I could be killed again. Fi sabidillahi. Because I know the reward that the Mujahideen are getting. Allah Ta'ala told him, anyone who leaves that earth and he dies, he doesn't go back again. He said, well then, oh Allah, I wish that you let the people know who are back there. Let them know what you prepare for people like me who were killed. Fi sabidillah. And then Allah Ta'ala revealed the ayat of the Quran. لا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون. Don't think those people who have been killed fi sabidillah, don't think that they're dead, but they are alive with their Lord. This is the father, Abdullah. Before the war, he said to his father, to his son, hey, Jabir, I am going to fight today, and I am not coming back. He said this to his son, and this is what I wanted to share with you, about how those companions were when it came to the hadith, when the prophet was speaking, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they're crying, they're afraid. It's as if you're about to roll out of here, ya Rasulullah. Today, the person hears the hadith, he won't go back to check the hadith that I told you about, and Nu'man ibn Bashir, and Abu Tha'lab al-Khushini. It ain't important. The father said to the son before the jihad, hey, listen, I'm not coming back today. I guarantee you I'm not coming back today. He said to his son, I'm telling you, there is no one that I'm leaving back on this earth more beloved to me than you other than the Prophet Wasallam. I love you, my son, more than your mother, more than my family, more than my mother, my family, whoever's on the first of the face of the earth, you, you, Jabber, I love you more than everybody. The only person I love more than you is the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when I get killed, because I'm not coming back, you make sure you take care of my debt. So the point here is the statement of the son. Whose Islam is like that? Who is Islam from amongst us is an Islam in which he says and he really feels in reality. Not he wants to be, he aspires to be. He understands he needs to be. I'm not talking about the reality. His reality is, I love the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sunnah more than all of you people. Whose reality is that? That was the reality not just of Abdullah, his son Jabir, Abu Bakr, and Uthman Ali. That was the reality of those companions. So when they heard him talking, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they say, Ya Rasulullah, says, if you're about to leave us, what do you tell us to do? And this is the point about what is the, min, what is the meaning of khilafatun ala min hajin nabuwa. There's going to be nabuwa with you. And then it remain and then Allah take it away. Then there's going to be a khilafa on the min hajj of a nabuwa. What is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is this hadith of Irbad ibn Usariya. أُسِيكُمْ بِتَقْوَ اللَّهِ وَالسَّمْعِ وَالطَّاعَةِ وَإِنْ تَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ حَبَشِيٌّ I, I order you. You think I'm about to leave and it's true, I'm leaving. So therefore I command you, I, I, I encourage you to fear Allah, a taqwa, and listen and obey your leader. Even if he is an Ethiopian slave, someone who you don't like is your leader. And then he went on to mention, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ وَالسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي عَبْدُ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْتَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْتَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٌ وَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالًا He told his companions, listen and obey the ruler, even if he's someone that you don't like. For verily, the one who lives from amongst you for a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. So take my sunnah. Allah will leave nabuwa. It's going to be nabuwa. Take my sunnah. And then there's going to be the khilafa on the minhaj of nabuwa. And then take the sunnah of the khulafa rashidin who are after me. So that's the minhaj of minhaj. So when Salafi people come and they say to the world and they say to the other groups and the other people on different manahij, you have to be on the minhaj of a nabuwa, the minhaj of the Prophet and his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the meaning of that. Minhaj is not a word like this, just a word someone decided to pick it out of his pocket. Minhaj is not a word that you have the luxury of sitting there and saying, I'll take it if I want, I'll leave it if I want. No, 
something you have to understand. Something that has to be part of your Islam. It's not rhetoric. Now concerning this issue of minhaj and what I just mentioned about this ayat and especially about this sunnah. There's some issues that Hwani and we close this out that I have to bring to your attention. Inshallah. Really critical, important issues. What is the benefit of the statement of the Prophet khilafatun ala minhaj al nabuwa? The fact that the Prophet said there's a minhaj, the khilafa that's on the minhaj of the nabuwa. He said that. What are some of the benefits of it that we have to comprehend, appreciate, understand, hold on to? There are many. Number one, it goes to show, during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa there was aqidah, what people believed, and iman. Like you, I heard the talk of the brother who's giving tafsir of the Quran and he was saying the Prophet taught us iman and he didn't teach us aqidah. I think our brother Abu Musa, he did a pretty good job in showing there are some problems there. Just stay balanced. There are some problems. We hope that that brother is guided to the minhaj of giving tafsir of the Quran in the correct way and to the minhaj of the salaf in terms of his existence. You have to understand, during the time of the Prophet wasallam. There was aqidah and there was iman. And aqidah and iman, sometimes it means the same thing. Sometimes it's different. Depending upon what is the ayah saying, what is the hadith saying, what is the speaker talking about. It's similar to al-Islam and al-Iman. Sometimes it means the same thing. Sometimes it's different. Al-birru wa taqwa. Sometimes it means the same thing. Sometimes it's different. If you have a minhaj and get a knowledge, you'll appreciate that and you'll know when and what is what. You won't make a blanket statement that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us Iman. He didn't teach us Aqidah. That's a statement of ignorance. But anyway, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was Aqidah. And that Aqidah was on a minhaj. Because the hadith said, the hadith that we just shared with you, it said, Khilafatun ala minhaj nabuwa. There's a minhaj during the time of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam his companions. So there's a minhaj when it comes to aqidah. There's a minhaj when it comes to ibadah. There's a minhaj when it comes to fiqh. There's a minhaj during their time when it comes to understanding the kalam of the Arabs. When it comes to understanding the kalam of Allah, the kalam of the Nabi. There was a minhaj back then. There's a way you understand the speech of the Arabs. So when the Arabs during that time and before that time heard Allah has a hand, Allah has this name, Allah has a characteristic. There's a minhaj that they were upon. Khilafatun ala minhaj al-nubuwa. What is minhaj? Al-tariq, al-wadih, al-bayyin, al-sahl. It was easy The Arabs, when they heard Allah has a hand, they didn't make it complicated and difficult with philosophy. There's a minhaj during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions when it came to how to deal with the leader ﷺ. How to choose the Khalifa. There's a minhaj. In Al-Iraq, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi becomes the Khalifa. He doesn't become the Khalifa for people who have a minhaj. Because the person knows during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, the Nabi told his companions how to go about choosing the Khalifa. And then the companions practically showed us that issue. There's a minhaj in terms of takfir. How the Nabi made takfir of people. How he dealt with the munafiqeen. How is the minhaj of dealing with the mubtadi? If a person doesn't have a minhaj, he doesn't know any of this. So during the time of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, during the time of his companions, there is a methodology in existing. Now I'm concerning, and this is a really important point, concerning the issue of al-iman, al-iman, aqidah, al-iman. There's a hadith that was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, on the authority of Abdullah ibn, on the authority of Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam to sleep in kathira al-iman bid'un wa sab'una aw bid'un wa sittuna shu'ba 
أعلاها قول لا إله إلا الله وأدناها إماتة الأذى عن التريق والحياء شعبة من الإيمان He says صلى الله عليه وسلم يا عبد الله يا مسلم يا أخي Faith, Al-Iman, what you believe. It is 70 or 60 something branches. The highest branch is the statement La ilaha illallah. The lowest branch is picking something up that is harmful that's in the street. And Al-Haya, shyness, modesty, is a branch of faith. So, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, there's Iman. Al-Iman has parts and branches. It has parts and branches, 70, 60 parts and branches. But the minhaj is one. There are no parts and no branches for the minhaj. The way is one. And everything other than that way is a problem. The minhaj of the Ikhwan Muslimin, the minhaj of the Sufi, the minhaj of the Takfiris, the minhaj is a problem. It's only one. I want to bring this to your attention. I hope you brothers are paying attention to this. Al-Iman, fiqh, ibadat, akhlaq, all of those things have a minhaj. The Sufi, he has akhlaq. But his akhlaq is he won't eat for 10 days and he wears clothes and he doesn't wash. That's akhlaq that he's trying to show he's a zahid. That akhlaq is not on the minhaj of a nubuwa. It's not on the minhaj of a nubuwa, but it is akhlaq. So that goes to show a few issues, really, really important. A person can have the correct aqidah. He can know the names and the attributes of Allah. If you were to ask him, Tawheed al-Rububiyah, Tawheed al-Asma' wa sifat he knows that stuff. He knows about the Mu'tazila and the Asha'ira and the Jahmiya and all those details. His aqidah is Salafi. But his minhaj is not Salafi. His minhaj is not Salafi. Because the way he's going about things, he may know these issues about aqidah, but he still believes in making khuruj. So a person can have the aqidah that's correct, he can have some akhlaq that's correct, he can have some fiqh that's correct, but it doesn't mean that his minhaj is correct. And that goes to show how the minhaj is more pervasive, is more prevailing than aqidah. The minhaj is hakam. On aqidah, not opposite. The minhaj is wider than the aqidah. And some of the ulama of the past, they used to differ in this issue, but it's the reality. As it relates ikhwani, to how al-iman has different branches, but but the minhaj is one, I end on this example. And there are many examples, but this is one of the clearest ones. If you were to look at the Quran, ya akhi, and I wish that this brother who was given tafsir of the Qur'an wouldn't shy away from the ayat of al-aqidah. If a person is shying away from the ayat of aqidah, no matter who he is, if he's known for giving tafsir of the Qur'an, don't shy away from the ayat of al-aqidah because inside of them are jewels. And the aqidah is the most important issue. Al-Iman, al-Tawheed is the most important issue. So how are you going to be a real da'i in Allah and your forte is tafsir, and you're shying away from the ayat of aqidah, knowing that the Qur'an has jewels and treasures. Look at one of these jewels and one of these treasures about the minhaj is only one. In the Qur'an, in all of the ayat, where Allah Ta'ala mentions and he contrasts vulumat, the darknesses, is always plural. Darkness is, is darkness. And nur is always one. The haq is always one. Always. Anytime, the rumat, the wrong ways, is plural. There are many wrong ways. But when it comes to a nur, and it's contrasted from the rumat, it's always one in the Quran. Because the minhaj is one. The path is one. After Ayatul Kursi, Surah Al Baqarah, Allah huwa liyu ladina amanu, yukhrijuhum min al dhulumati ila nur, wa ladina kafaru awliyahum al taagut, yukhrijunuhum min al nuri ila dhulumat, ulaik ashabun nari hum fiha khalidun. 
Allah is the wali of those who believe. Allah will take them from the dhulumat, from the many paths. Some of us who are not guided before, we are Christians, we're into the streets, we're into crazy groups, we weren't practicing. We, we represent different paths, people who are not practicing, who are now trying to practice. Allah is the wali of those who believe. He takes them from dhulumat. There are many different ways. And he brings them to the nur, which is one. Minhaj, which is one. And another ayat in Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am, the contrast. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala mentioned, Allah alladhi khalaqa, huwa alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard, wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur. Allah is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And all the ayat is, Alhamdulillah, alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard, wa ja'ala dhulumati wal nur. All praises are due to Allah who he made the heavens and he made the earth and he made dhulumat and he made nur. The plural of nur is anwar. But it never comes plural. Dhulumat is plural. But it's always nur, one. He created the heavens, he created the earth and he created dhulumat and he created one nur. He mentioned in another ayat of the Quran subhanahu wa ta'ala Alif Lam Ra Kitabun and Zanahu Ilay Li Tuhri Janas Min of Dulumati in a Nuri be Idni Robbihim Ela Serat Al Aziz Al Hamid Alif Lam Ra Allah is the one who sent to you, Ya Muhammad, the book, gave you the Quran so that you can lead the people from the Dulumat into the Nur by the permission of the Lord to the Sirat, the Sirat. Al Azizul Hamid. What is the Sirat? The Sirat is the Tariq al Wadih. Al Imam Abu Jafir and Nuhaz, when he gave in Mu'ani al Quran, what is the meaning of Sirat in the Quran? As Sirat, when it's talking about the Sirat al Mustaqim, not the Sirat of the people who are astray, the Sirat al Mustaqim is what? Al Minhaj al Wadih. One, one way, one way. So all of the ayat of the Quran are like that. All of them, they are like that. He mentioned in Surah Fatir, ayat number 20, when he contrasted a number of things between themselves. He mentioned, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa la yastawi al-a'ma wal-basir, wa la dhulumati wa la nur. They are not equal. Those who are blind and those who can see, nor the dhulumat or the nur. So the point here, Khwani has, again, as I mentioned, this is one of the clear proofs, one of the clear indications that Al-Minhaj, unlike those other things that were present during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibadat, Fiqh, Fahim of the Kalam, different ways you can understand. They had a Minhaj for all of that. And other people had other Minhaj. So the Imam and the Shu'ab of Imam branches are many, but the Minhaj is only one. And I'll end with the Hadith of the Companion May Allah be pleased with them all. He said that the Prophet drew for them one line, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then he drew subsequent lines on the right and the left, and then he said, هذا سراط الله المستقيم المنهاج الواضح This is Allah's path that is clear and is straight. وَهَذِي سُبَلْ عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلِ مِنْهَا شَيْطَانٌ يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهَا And these are the divergent path, the dhulumat, the different manahij. And then the Prophet read to them the ayat of the Quran, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Nahada Sarati Mustaqim Fatabiu, Wala Tatabu Sabi as Subal, Fatafara Kabikum and Sabidihi. Follow my path, my minhaj, my minhaj. And don't follow all of the other divergent minahaj, the other divergent subal, because they would take you away from the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. Inni Turaktukum, Anal Mahajat al Bayba, Layruha Kan Nahaliha. I left you on a clear path, a clear minhaj. His night is like his daytime. It is waldih. His night is like this day. No one forsakes it, passes it up, except that he will be destroyed. So this is our first talk, Ikhwani, and some of our durus that we're going to give concerning the minhaj. As I mentioned, many of you brothers are sitting there and we say, Ahlan wa sahlan. And we know that you want the barakah of sitting between Maghrib and Isha. We also know that 
Some of you have been consistent in many of the classes where you know sitting in the masjid it has some virtues connected to it. And all of the classes that we put forward, we have you in mind. People we want to inspire, people we want to inform, people we want to motivate. But these talks about the minhaj is salafi. These talks about the minhaj are going to be a bit more technical. So I want some of you younger brothers to be people who are writing. Because if I go back now and I start asking you some questions that I need you to comprehend and understand, you're not going to remember. You're not going to remember. So some of you brothers, Abdul Qadir, Sharif, Adawi, Nur din you brothers like that, you go back, you take notes for this first class, and inshallah, the rest in the subsequent classes are going to be like that. We don't want to run anybody away, but as we mentioned, inshallah, we're living in the time of Haysa Baysa, Topsy Derby, Sinawat Khadda'at, Salafi people themselves have all kinds of things that are going on, and we don't know how to navigate through all of this stuff because we're parroting off things and not really comprehending them in a scholastic way, properly. Our tawfiq collectively is from Allah Azza wa Jal, Wahduhu la sharika lahu, Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. If you guys have any questions, inshallah, you send those questions to my email, send those questions to my uh, Facebook, inshallah, so that we can answer the questions properly. After researching, understanding, we don't want to just talk off the cuff and give answers in such an important issue. So if you get those questions to me, inshallah, I'll have a week or so, a few days, look at it, get research on it so that we can come back and really have some thabat in this particular issue. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You ready, little man? Are you ready? Hey, Sharif, I thought you were asleep in here. I thought you were الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله يا أن الصلاة يا على الفلا يا على الفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين <تصفيق> تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شهيقا وهي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر 
Allah الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وأسروا قولكم أو اجهروا به إنه عليم بذات الصدور ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير هو الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور أأمنتم من في السماء أن يخسف بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن يرسل عليكم حاصبا فستعلمون كيف نذير ولقد كذب الذين من قبلهم فكيف كان نكير الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله الله
الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله اللهم استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله اللهم السلام يا رجال الله ربي عندنا لا إله إلا الله 